Monetary Policy Committee press briefing. The Monetary Policy Committee held a meeting yesterday, July the 28th, and as is usual, today, July the 29th, uh, the Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Njoroge, will be giving a background briefing as to that Monetary Policy Committee meeting and the press statement that you've all seen. As we usually do, the Governor will run through his background briefing. After that, we shall take questions. Uh, we shall take those questions on Slido, that's S-L-I-D-O. The meeting code is uh, hashtag MPC07, MPC07. Without further ado, the Central Bank of Kenya Governor, Dr. Patrick Njoroge. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, warm welcome to all of you joining us for, for this briefing. Uh, following the MPC meeting yesterday. Uh, this is now customary. And uh, as before, the MPC, yesterday the MPC examined closely the recent economic developments, particularly against the backdrop of the policy action uh, over the last uh, few months. So I'm going to step through the various sectors or the various areas um, as we have done before. And before doing that, I think the first place to start is in the global developments. And this really is dominated uh, by the progress or the outcomes in the vaccination programs in the various countries. And as of uh, July 24th, um, just a few days ago, about 26.9% of uh, world population had received at least one dose of the um, COVID-19 vaccine. However, only about 1.1% of those that had received, of, of the population in the low-income countries, had received at least one dose. And I think the slide that has been shown now is uh, specific outcomes in the various countries. Um, and I think the data here is July 24th. Um, it's interesting that Kenya, uh, Kenya, as of uh, July 28th, yesterday, uh, it had, one, it had one, uh, a population of uh, 1.052 million had received at least one shot. This is about 2.2% of the overall population. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it is something that uh, is of concern. And uh, indeed, also noting the positivity rates that uh, we have as of yesterday, 18%. But going back to the global developments, the, the the, the outcome of the vaccination programs has been significant in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the output uh, prospects for, for growth in the various countries. There has been another item which we'll come back to, which is the issue of inflation, inflation dynamics. And uh, as you'll see on the slide, uh, the global consumer price uh, inflation, CPI really, um, has been uh, moving generally up in the, particularly in the advanced economies. Um, you can see the, the advanced economies are shown in the blue, in the blue, um, in, in the blue line. And the solid red line is also the emerging markets. Also you can see um, in the later period has taken a decided upturn. Um, our countries, on the other hand, the low-income countries, uh, you can see that's the green line and you can see that it's coming down. It's been coming down. Um, this is the sort of developments that are out there and I think it, it is important because there is a lot of noise now in the, uh, let's say, in the advanced economies about their inflation, uh, the dynamics relating to inflation, and uh, that has also in some sense, rebounded to, uh, to us. Moving along, the next item uh, that is also important is uh, what are called the gyration in oil prices. And uh, I think there's a slide uh, that, the next slide, please. Uh, 
um, that we need to look at, which is the generation of the, of the oil, crude oil prices. And from our perspective, the Marban, uh, Marban category um, or crude is, uh, is a, our good indicator. And you can see that there has been a decided increase um, in the recent months um, from uh, the low of uh, April 20, uh, April 2020 when uh, it was priced at $21 a barrel. And now we are in the, uh, se around the $70 range, um, $70 per barrel. That is also something that is significant in terms of uh, impacting the overall inflation in the global economy, um, but also in terms of other dynamics. As we know, oil is an important input um, right through. Finally, on uh, two days ago, we received the update from uh, the IMF, otherwise known as the WIO, World Economic Outlook update of uh, um, their developments as they see them in the global developments. Suffice it to say that the overall um, growth rate for, for the global economy was not changed for 2021. And, uh, but actually for 2022, it was increased by uh, 0 0.5 percentage points. Uh, but it's interesting that there has been a lot of, a lot of uh, let's say, uh, changes within the countries. Um, they revised up the U.S., significantly so, uh, to 7%. The U.S. growing at 7% in 2021. Of course, we know that they're coming, from a, coming off a very low base. Um, and that included an increase, uh, sort of an improvement of uh, 0 0.6 percentage points. Um, there's also a larger improvement in 2022 of about 1.4 uh, percentage points. Be that as it may, India, China, and indeed the ASEAN countries, more generally uh, thinking about the emerging markets, that's where growth was lowered and India was lowered by three percentage points, um, China by 0 0.3, etc. All, of course, incorporating uh, the recent, uh, let's say, outcomes with regard to coronavirus. So South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers there remain the same as before. 3.4 percentage, uh, 3.4, a growth of 3.4% in 2021 followed by a projected growth of 4.1% in 2022. We'll leave the discussion of the individual countries for later. So I now want to move to the domestic space. And, uh, and the first item here is the inflation dynamics. There's a slide that uh, um, we are going to put on the, on the, on the screen. It uh, shows the recent dynamics right from June of 2020. And you can see that uh, the overall inflation has remained, that is the, uh, the dotted, uh, black dotted line. Um, the most recent number is 6.3. And again, this to understand it, this is year on year, meaning it is um, 12 months. So it is June 21 over June uh, 2020. Um, so the, the point here is that it's at 6.3, which is inside the range. Um, our range, our target range is 5% plus or minus 2.5. Um, percentage points. So it's inside the range. It's gone up a little from, let's say, the around 6, 5.8, 5.7, um, or in December 5.6, December last year. And you can say it actually has gone up even compared to the period, the earlier, uh, the earlier period, you know, in the, since June 2020. But it's still within the range. So, but I think it is important to look at the individual components. And this is why I wanted to really um, have a conversation about this slide. So the first of this, of course, is the food and fuel. And you can see the food is the is a blue uh, sort of stack, the blue um, bars. And you can see that is increasing. It's now at 8.5%. Now, 
if you begin to look at the individual components, what are the components or the food components that are changing? And I think here is where you, um, over the 12 months, you have seen changes, let's say, in uh, um, cooking oil, beef with bone, white bread, white flour. Those are the large items. Um, we are showing you here, but I think uh, don't be too focused on the percentages. The percentages are a bit, uh, well, they are not accurate, meaning the percentages, they need to be scaled down, but uh, to be scaled, but let's leave that. The direction is clear, and the size, relative size, is, uh, is accurate. So you can see the items that have really contributed, the food items that have really contributed to the, um, to the inflation outcome of food at 8.5%. And this, as you can imagine, is attributed to, uh, first and foremost, the, some of the increases that we've seen in imported inputs. So for instance, cooking oil, that is produced from individual components, you know, palm oil or whatever other oils that are imported. And those prices have gone up significantly. The same thing we think with wheat, for instance, and hence bread and uh, wheat flour. So there's a huge component, uh, import component. Um, now, in terms of wheat, we'll soon get, I guess, the, uh, the outputs or the harvest from uh, in the wheat growing areas in, uh, in Kenya, Narok, etc. And so we expect those prices to be moderated um, as the new supplies come into the market. Uh, but I think the point here is that uh, there is some of the um, sort of external pressures. There's also other pressures, domestic pressures. Um, if you look at this from a perspective of month on month, so here is where we, you know, the, the 12 months is a bit, uh, may not always, uh, let's say, um, resonate with consumers maybe the month on month. So you go to the market today, and uh, you are there, let's say, a month ago, um, and uh, you see the sticker shock, you know, the change in price um, between one month and the next. And there you have things like Sukuma Wiki. Those have really moved uh, in the last uh, sort of over one month. Um, Sukuma Wiki has been big there as well, beef with bones, etc. Um, but I think also those components or those uh, products are being driven, some of them by, by uh, seasonality or seasonal factors, particularly Sukuma Wiki, which are very seasonal, as we know. So there may be other seasonal factors that have pushed the, the prices, the, uh, the food prices, and hence you get the quote-unquote sticker shock um, when you go to the, uh, to the market to buy um, specific products that have generally uh, remained, uh, whose prices have only, have remained stable, or have grown sort of moderately. But suddenly you, you do see that they've moved dramatically and you will remember that. So that's on the food side. Um, supply chain concerns is important and I mentioned it in the context of wheat, uh, but I think more, you know, I mentioned in the context of, uh, of uh, oil oil imports, so leading to cooking oil, etc. But I think the supply chain concerns are more widespread, they, not just in terms of food, but also in terms of uh, other intermediate imports, etc., as we mentioned later. Then there is obviously the issue of uh, fuel. Um, I mentioned the fuel item, I think I did uh, mention the, the change in, uh, in prices meaning in crude marban oil, which is what uh, really is a good indicator of uh, our, the prices um, of the imported items, even though we import finished products. Um, but I think that is a good indicator of uh, our prices out there. Uh, the other item I would want to flag in this is the non-food, non-fuel. So if you remove non-food, if you remove food and fuel from the CPI, what happens? And that's the green one at the bottom, the green bars at the bottom. And you can see they've remained around, well, below, two, below 3%. So they are around 2.5 now, 
uh, is the latest number. So those have remained stable, and uh, they do not uh, portend to uh, demand pressures. Um, on the contrary, they show that uh, demand pressures are muted. So that's all I wanted to mention. Uh, well, there's one other item that I would want to mention, which I presume you have also been considering, which is the impact of the tax measures that were in the, in the finance bill uh, and the indexation of uh, the various, uh, let's say, taxes, the excise taxes on the various components. So we've actually summed all those together and, uh, and assessed the impact on the CPI, on inflation, uh, for all these measures. And it amounts to a sum of uh, 1.78 percentage points. So if, if everything else was flat, meaning all other prices were not changing, and this was the only impact, the only change was due to the, uh, these taxes and indexation, then inflation would be, um, would be 1.78 percentage points. So that is the overall impact um, in terms of, uh, of those measures. I want to now move uh, to other things, which is on the output. And, uh, and here I wanted actually today to spend a lot more time on this portion. And then I'll be quick on most of the other components. So the leading indicators. Why is it that I want to talk a bit more about the leading indicators? It's because I think there's more, um, let's say, uncertainty and more, uh, well, the numbers have not been uh, digested that much. Uh, partly because, they are, they are, well, a lot of these numbers are leading indicators and you need to know where to go to them. So um, I wanted to at least attempt to uh, reset the balance in this area. First item, and I'll go through the large sectors. So first of this is agriculture. And, uh, and really, we are coming off a very strong performance uh, in 2020. But now we have an, an even rainfall. Um, that's what we have uh, seen. And uh, particularly, the, the outlook as we have it for June, July, and August. So this is an important growing season, June, July, August. And it looks like uh, rainfall during this period uh, will be, the outcome will be worse or lower as compared to 2020. So that's one thing. And then we have also seen, so this will lead to, let's say, poor uh, crop conditions. And uh, we've already, therefore, assessed lower yields um, in terms of maize, wheat, et cetera. So that's one thing that uh, is clear from uh, the numbers or the various uh, indicators. Horticultural exports, uh, that, is, uh, that is doing quite well. Um, let me see if there was something I wanted to say, yes. Um, in terms of uh, exports of uh, horticultures, um, this is up, uh, in the month of June, it's up 26.7%. And this is year on year. So the period to, uh, no, it's uh, year on year. So 26% relative to the, uh, the period before, the, uh, the, the June month in 2020. But I, <clears throat> for the duration January through June, um, all the growth rates have been positive. I, I want to confirm with my people whether that is a tough month, or whether it is tough month or it is for the period. Uh, is it month? Okay, we'll get, the, we'll get the answer. I just want to be sure that the 26.7%, whether it is June on June or whether it is for the 12th month, the cumulative 12th month. OK, so please. Um, but as you can see, for the entire period, so meaning the first half of 2021, um, all the growth rates are positive. And, uh, and I think uh, that is, uh, let's see, we have it there.
I'm sorry. We uh, okay. It's it wasn't in the in this detailed slide, so let it be. But those are the numbers. Um, secondly, in terms of tea production, tea production actually has uh, has been down, and uh, if you are thinking right through January, uh, the relative to the period, uh, this same period in 2020, um, it is minus 8.8, .8, minus 11 percent, minus 11 percent, and in April, minus also 11 percent, 10.8. Now, we also know that uh, there has been, this is uh, comparable to the exports. And, uh, and I think the issue here is more on the production side, um, though on exports there was also an acceleration um, in the period, uh, in the first quarter of last year, uh, uh, acceleration of exports to the UK and India um, as they anticipated sort of uh, uh, concerns related to lockdown, etc. So that also is uh, kind of, uh, uh, well, is negative, meaning the numbers, the tea production has been on the decline. In terms of livestock production, that actually milk delivery, for instance, that has been very strong, positive, um, and has grown uh, at 10% or above. In the February was 20%, March was 12%, and April was um, 10%. Uh, January was flat at 0.6%, um, but that actually, that trend has continued. And uh, finally, with regard to agriculture, uh, credit to agriculture has remained strong, um, which is a bit surprising uh, because credit to agriculture generally, well, it follows the crop cycle, you know. It, uh, it's a leading indicator of uh, what's happening in terms of uh, that sector. Um, but I think the numbers have remained strong. In April, it was 10 percent. May, 4, uh, June, 4 percent. Um, but again, that follows the, uh, the crop pattern as it was. Uh, construction sector has been very strong. And uh, if you could uh, show the cement numbers in the slide, please. Um, the the cement production has been quite strong, and this have, uh, has actually been aligned with uh, consumption of cement. Um, the, the graph you see has, is really the raw numbers. You know, it really just grabs the raw numbers and, uh, and presents it in a visual way. Um, but anyway, so you can see there in, in, uh, for the period through May, the growth rates have been really high, uh, and the most recent in the period to May um, of uh, 39 percent. Um, additionally, now we can see that this obviously has uh, uh, has been strong, and it has been supported in part by the strong government infrastructure spending. So that is something that I think we have been talking about in the past. Manufacturing sector, which has been one of the sectors that we've watched. Um, very closely. Um, and I think the first thing to talk about there is the turnover. Um, turnover on the sales turnover. Slide, please. Uh, the, you can see it is, uh, again, for the period January through June. Um, it's been quite strong. Uh, and in June uh, was at 18%. These are growth rates, year on year growth rates. Um, so I think it is remarkable that uh, manufacturing has actually been doing this well. April, May, you can see, was particularly strong. So in terms of uh, the other lines on the chart, the black line is the, um, relates to the sales turnover, and that's uh, on the left-hand side. Um, so, and then the, the 2020 is the red one, so you can see the black is really way above the the red, and that is also way above the blue, which was 2019. So sales turnover speaks to strong uh, production. Um, we've talked about production of cement, 
But I also want to show you the import of intermediate inputs. Um, there are several slides on this, but I'll just pick up one, you know, in the same area, um, or has the same rough design. Uh, here it is. So this is intermediate imports, excluding fuel and other lubricants. And you can see the growth rate is quite strong. Actually, intermediate inputs began growing strongly around uh, the second, no, the, the last quarter of last, of last year, of 2020. And uh, you can see that has remained very, very strong. Again, these are growth rates. The greens are growth rates, yeah? 30%, um, 37%, 28%. These are significant. So again, this is a period where you can, that, that this portends to sort of a lot of dynamism in the manufacturing sector or a return to strong uh, dynamism in this sector or rebound in this sector. The other numbers we can talk about, there's power consumption. Um, I, I'm not sure if we have the slide on power consumption, but, uh, uh, and I'm sorry if I belabor these things. So if we have the slide, basically power, total power consumption has, there it is, it has also grown very strongly. Um, and uh, large power consumers on the top left, the top right, and low, small uh, commercial consumers uh, bottom right, and you can see the growth rates also are quite uh, strong. So that's, um, finally, of course, we talk about credit, and credit to the manufacturing sector has also remained strong. Um, increased, it has continued, it has increased by 8.1% in June, uh, or to June of uh, 2021. Has also, during the period in the first half, actually the lowest growth was in May at 1.5. Um, but uh, the first quarter, it was at 13, 15, 10, 4, etc. Let's move to finance. Uh, finance will be very quick. Uh, I think this is a number we have a strong pulse on. And uh, basically, uh, credit and deposits have also grown sharp, have also uh, remained, the growth has remained strong uh, despite COVID. And uh, as we say, the June numbers is 7.7. .7. That's the growth rate in private sector credit. Um, and uh, in terms of deposits to June is 8.1 growth. So, and all those numbers are significant. Um, and I think uh, it, it portends to, um, yeah, output in the sector finance and insurance or growth in output. The one that is really curious um, in some sense, and I'll say why, is ICT. ICT is completely off the charts, completely off the charts. Um, in all the leading indicators that we have, all the leading indicators that we have. So in terms of uh, transactions, mobile money transactions, um, all the indicators, they are off the charts. Um, meaning growing very, very strongly. Um, and it's not a surprise because after all, during the COVID period, a lot of us um, switched or let's say began to use our, our sort of uh, ICT uh, connections, both in terms of not just the money, but also in terms of uh, working from home, um, et cetera, entertainment, ordering things, uh, on uh, online, so ICT was really the backbone that helped us. And in our own words, we call it that this is the this was the silver lining um, during this period. So no wonder all indicators are off the charts. And this is why we've been a bit curious uh, when we have seen indicators that uh, let's say KNBS has put out, uh, which are kind of flattish. Um, and this is way back, like uh, six months ago. Um, so we queried those things, and I think uh, we obviously are supporting them in terms of providing the information they need uh, to complete and to give us some uh, good indicators. So that is something that I think we, uh, we are hopeful about in terms of uh, positive numbers that have come from the ICT. Um, then wholesale and retail. 
And I'm sorry for belaboring this, but this to me is the heart of uh, the discussion um, in terms of what maybe has been missing in the past. Um, so wholesale and retail, uh, which was also curious in the context of COVID, and uh, sales turnover uh, have also been, uh, have increased to pre-COVID levels actually. And, uh, and I don't have the slide there, but, uh, but I think in terms of growth rate to June it is 12.5. And uh, in a sense, we've caught up with where it was um, last time, meaning uh, 12, a year ago. So that is important. At the same time, you look at other indicators, diesel consumption, um, that relates to, let's say, you know, transportation of uh, various things. Um, so diesel consumption uh, and uh, that has also increased and credit to the sector has also increased. Um, the last number was, uh, yeah, has also increased. The other sectors that I wanted to touch on was accommodation and restaurants. Um, this is important because it connects directly uh, to the, uh, to, the uh, to the tourism sector. I'm sorry, I'm taking my time to get to it. Um, and, uh, and here, first and foremost, in terms of credit, uh, credit has been, credit growth to the, credit to restaurants and hotels has also remained strong, has grown strongly. 6.7% in June, 6.3% um, in May, 7% in April, etc. cetera. Um, and sales turnover, this is curious. Uh, sales turnover also has grown uh, remarkably strongly, um, given in the context of what we had. And I think you have the slide there. So you can see the growth rates are off the charts, obviously, because the, uh, you know, last year nothing was happening, basically, um, in the same period, uh, because of the, the, the lockdown that we were having. But now you can see the black line compared to the red line, um, and you can see that uh, there's an 81% increase, and we expect that that will continue because the, uh, the hotels have remained open for the most part, and we'll talk about that later. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about education, which is a small, which is a large sector, but it is important because there has been a change in the methodology in terms of KNBS, given the situation that uh, we were in last year, that the students were um, learning at home, and now they are back at school, and uh, actually staying in school longer um, in terms of weeks. Um, so I think uh, parents are the ones that are now maybe more concerned about where the kids are, et cetera, but uh, that, is, uh, that is something that obviously we wanted to touch on because it was a concern last year. Putting it all together, where are we? I think the first point to mention here is that uh, the recovery clearly uh, is coming through. So there's a strong recovery. All the, most of the numbers indicate to a strong recovery in the first half of 2021 um, after, let's say, the weaknesses that we had seen in uh, 2020. We are using leading indicators and we hope that uh, KNBS will, if, after they are finished um, in due time, when they are finished with their analysis, will have numbers that, uh, um, that actually the final numbers, or should we say final numbers that collaborate with uh, what we are saying today. Secondly, um, there remains an output gap, um, in, particularly in the services sector. And uh, this relates, let's say, to the accommodation and restaurants. Um, we can imagine that uh, they, they are not work, uh, working at full capacity. But I think the point here is that, uh, um, and it isn't just the hotels, it's also the restaurants. And uh, this obviously will, that output gap will be closed um, with the further reopening of the economy as those sectors um, in a sense, begin to work more normally, et cetera. And of course, uh, this is underpinned by, let's say, the vaccina vaccination programs 
here in Kenya, but also in the, let's say, the source countries where the tourists are coming from. Uh, a third point I wanted to make at this point is the government's economic recovery strategy. And that has actually has been discussed and uh, underpinned in the, or let's say supported in the context of the budget, the most recent budget, the, um, the finance bill. And uh, so in a sense, it looks like we have, uh, um, we have a bit of dynamism, um, or there is some dynamism in the economy, and we hope that that momentum can pick up and continue right through 2021 and indeed through 2020. There are a few other items I wanted to mention, uh, and now, if you may, I'll move uh, reasonably fast or reasonably quickly. Um, the market perception survey. Uh, there are three surveys, as you know, that we are now doing. The first is the market sur perception survey, and this really showed very strong optimism um, with banks uh, um, reporting 85% of them are optimistic in terms of uh, uh, prospects of the economy. And non-banks generally more, uh, well, less optimistic, but still at 65%. So you can see the dynamics in terms of uh, how things have been over the years, over the last one and a half years. Um, but I think the point to make is all these surveys will be available in the next couple of days, presumably by Monday. Um, they'll be available on our website, and you can actually have, uh, you can interrogate uh, those questions a lot more there. The second one is the CEO survey. Um, this is another one that we are doing uh, uh, on uh, a survey of their perceptions and views about things. And the only thing I want to say here is that uh, um, the, it shows that businesses are optimistic. Um, and uh, a lot of that underpinned in the ways that you'd, you could have expected, which is underpinned by the vaccination program, um, sort of a return to normalcy. And of course, the various programs that are there, uh, not just the government investment, but also other, well, other actions that are being done in the, in the various sectors. Um, the hotel survey, oh, I should also say that the, in the, there, there are also some, re some points that were put out as uh, points of concern. And I think uh, there are some there in terms of, uh, um, well, the cash flow and uh, political uncertainty, so let's say political activity uh, that is, uh, well, that may lead to a delay in decisions. And indeed also the question about increased taxes. So moving along to, uh, hotel service. The only thing I want to, uh, to mention here is that uh, um, you, we see that most of the hotels in the country have reopened. So in the rest of the country, virtually all of them are. Um, and in Nairobi, there are still some, particularly the ones that were highly dependent on uh, external, uh, let's say, uh, clients. Um, so those remain closed. There are some that are uh, still going through some sort of, uh, let's say, ownership, or should we say restructuring, uh, yeah, restructuring of their ownership, et cetera. But the point is that uh, we are coming back in closer to opening, uh, to having all of them reopened. The question isn't just opening, of course. The question is, are we having reservations? And uh, what exactly, what are, what are the levels of, uh, um, yeah, accommodation or occupancy? And I think those you can uh, you can uh, find more about those answers in the in the final survey or in the survey uh, documents as we publish them uh, after we publish them in the next couple of days. Um, again, moving along quickly on the external sector, the exports. Uh, that's a good story on exports. We talked about horticulture, but more generally. So these have remained strong and in the first half growing by 11%. We talked about tea, um, the, the sort of decline. Um, I also mentioned that uh, there was an acceleration in 2020, which sort of pushed up the exports in, those, uh, in that period. Um, but I think uh, the other thing we need to mention is that uh, there has been 
more recently, over the last uh, month or so, actually the last few weeks, there has been a change in the, uh, let's say there has been a significant increase in coffee prices worldwide. Um, and, uh, and that is as a result of the, uh, the frost that has is, that is now been experienced in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil. So in a sense, we, have, we will benefit from that uh, in terms of just uh, the, the increase in prices in the markets. Um, remittances as well have remained strong, and I don't want to say too much about that, except uh, um, that, uh, yeah, now we would see a sort of a decline in terms of, of uh, the seasonality, and then a pickup later in the, uh, in the year as we approach December. Um, but I think the point also is that seasonality now is a bit, um, the, the normal seasonal patterns has been thrown um, sort of uh, out of sync because of all the, let's say, the changes that we have done. Some monies are sent back home for school fees. So, you know, the, the academic uh, calendar has changed, um, etc. So I think the point here is that uh, we cannot be so sure of the seasonal pattern that we had observed before that it will apply. Uh, but I think the point here is that remittances remain quite strong. Some of you last time had asked us about uh, South Africa. How come uh, um, maybe now that you have been seeing the detailed numbers, uh, what happened there? And I think the point there is it relates to the conditions of uh, the people that are working in South Africa, the Kenyans that are working there. Um, and so in a sense, as that economy picks up, uh, we will begin to get stronger, um, yeah, stronger remittances from that country. We noticed that actually just in the month of June, there was a significant increase, and we hope that that will remain. Um, current account, uh, I think the point to make there is that it's at 5.25, 5.4% um, to June, and uh, we expect that that will remain at 5.2% uh, for the year. Yeah, that's correct. 5.4 to June, and 5.2% for the uh, at the end of the year. Of course, uh, that really puts together all the transactions that are taking place in the current account. There has also been uh, significant transactions, as you know, on the, on the uh, capital account side, um, and uh, in particular some of the flows that, that the government received at the end of June, and uh, et cetera. Now, on reserves, I think there's only one word to say that, uh, yeah, they, they remain adequate. The number that we put out uh, is uh, currently about 9.35 9.35 billion uh, in terms of uh, U.S. dollars, and that's five point um, north of 5.7 months of import cover. So we believe that that is adequate, uh, more than we believe. Obviously, it is adequate, and uh, we shouldn't have any concerns. In, in that uh, department, as it were. I want to move quickly then to finish, uh, but before finishing, I do need to say uh, maybe three elements. First, on the government securities market, this has, um, at the end of uh, FY of the fiscal year, that's at the end of June, um, this actually, the outcome was quite uh, impressive. And uh, first, very stable yield curve. Um, net domestic borrowing target was met. Uh, it was 521.9 billion, 521.9 billion. And uh, yeah, now it was 521.7 billion. So, but the point is that it's amazing that uh, they got to this. Um, so the accuracy there is, uh, in my view, well, quite amazing, and our team should be congratulated for it. The other thing to mention is the lengthening of the average time to maturity for bonds. Um, 
In June 2019, two years before, it was 7.7%. And this has been increased to 8 point, not 7.7, is 7.7 uh, 7 uh, years. And this has been increased to 8.6. So that's the average time to maturity, 8.6 years. Now, the ratio also bills to bonds. Two years ago, it was 34% bills, treasury bills, and 66% uh, bonds, so one-third, two-thirds. And uh, this has been improved to 21% uh, bills, 79% bonds, so 20%, 80%. And that improvement is something that is really beneficial to government. Um, and I think uh, this is a good, a very good indicator of uh, the collaboration that has taken place between the central bank and the national treasury um, to achieve these outcomes. And uh, again, as I say, it's remarkable and uh, they should be congratulated for it. That said, um, everything isn't always positive. There has everybody has to be pushed a little. And I think uh, in terms of liquidity management, um, at the end of June and beginning of July, as you can imagine, the government received a lot of our external flows and it used uh, um, a lot of this um, to pay, to make payments for the pending bills. And so we did have a huge inflow or influx of liquidity um, as the government paid on uh, the pending bills and indeed also made payments to the counties. And, uh, and so those payments, the pending bills, for instance, uh, will, those, the liquidity will move through the, um, through the economy. And uh, in the first instance, of course, we were, uh, w we were doing open market operations to ensure that uh, it doesn't cause significant damage uh, to or stability in the in the in the in the economy. Now, of course, this will hit the pockets of uh, individual um, producers. You know, let's say those that had bills, um, you know, builders or you know suppliers, etc. Particularly for the counties, and so this is actually going to be, um, let's say, very positive in terms of growth. Uh, going forward. So I think even as we say that we did have, we did work, we did have, we need, we did some work to, um, let's say, to manage the liquidity, we also understand that this will be beneficial and therefore we are obviously letting it go uh, gently, um, meaning reducing the open market operations as we go forward. Um, the financial also, the last point on this is the good news that we had at the end of the year, all of us, in terms of the fiscal uh, outcome. And I think there are several points. One, uh, KRA, Kenya Revenue Authority, um, it hit its, uh, let's say, customs targets. It has been hitting its customs targets since December of 2020. And that, I think, is really remarkable. Um, and uh, it has also been close in terms of the domestic ta taxes. It has also been close to its target, but uh, towards the end, meaning as we approached March, it actually began to hit those uh, as well. Um, that, I think, is remarkable. And uh, they have some work to do, of course. But I think uh, uh, it's remarkable that uh, that outcome was, uh, is what we have. Of course, for the end year and June, they met their overall target and uh, met and achieved, uh, you know, beyond that. So I think the point here is that uh, we can see um, a bit of dynamism, and this is in the context of a COVID-19 uh, COVID year. So I think it has to be appreciated that it has required a lot of effort, um, both from the perspective of the tax authority, but particularly from the perspective of the, um, of the payers. Um, in this regard. Now, um, the outcome actually for the year, uh, as we said in our, in our press uh, release, was a deficit of 7.8% of GDP. These are very provisional number. So it's a very sort of like flash number, 7.8%. It will be tightened 
that is 7.8 percent of uh, GDP, which compares to um, what was planned for, which was much larger, was something like 8.4. Um, so actually, it is flat compared to the outcome that was there in 20, the fiscal year 2019-20. Uh, so fiscal year 1920. Well, I don't know if now I'm getting myself confused, but the previous fiscal year. Um, so I think this is remarkable uh, because uh, for the first time, I, in, I guess since I can remember, you know, at least at the top of my head, we, we have achieved a target. We have actually overachieved on a target. And uh, I think it is something that uh, uh, the fiscal authorities should also be congratulated on. So those are the things I wanted to, start, to finish on, but uh, the one, the last item that I need to mention is that yes, there was a, a few days ago, um, the, we published uh, a paper on the modernization of our monetary policy framework and operations. And, uh, and I think you've probably seen that paper um, the, the, um, I, I think maybe it has been difficult to explain it. So I think the way to think about it is we need to, you maintain your car, let's say. You, everybody maintains their car and they tweak it every now and then. Um, but uh, maybe you have a Land Rover or you owned a Land Rover like that, which was a workhorse as we know in the, in our neck of the woods, right? Um, but uh, the road has been improved. They now have super highways, et cetera. Um, so maybe what you had before, uh, may, even though it is working well, et cetera, um, as a car, uh, you probably need to, uh, to change it to some other car um, because, you know, to accommodate the new improvements around you, et cetera, you know, higher top speed, et cetera, less, uh, emissions. Um, it's a very good car for sure, but uh, you do need to keep up with the, with the changing circumstances. So changing what needs to be changed, that is what that paper is about. And uh, there are things there um, that uh, really uh, will, we, the MPC has indicated that we need to work on so that we can actually modernize it and be, uh, make our monetary operations and indeed the, our monetary policy uh, much more effective. So that's really the point and I think it's available on, the, on, the, on our website. So thank you very much. I'm open now to questions. That was the governor, Dr. Patrick Njoroge, uh, making, uh, giving us a background to the MPC decision um, from a lot more information therein. Uh, we should uh, those have come through uh, the Slido system. The first one is George Obolutsa from Reuters News. George asks, expound on the plans to modify monetary policy to align the CBR and the interbank rate in addition to inflation forecasting. When will this take place? The other question is from uh, Limo Taboy. He's from uh, Bankelele. He's asking, what's the uptake and performance of STAWI? The third question is from David Indeje from Husoko. David says, kind of expound more on the recently published white paper on monetary policy and the time frame needed to complete the needed reforms. Okay, thank you. Um, so, George, uh, I think my suggestion is you read the paper. Um, there's a lot of material in there. And uh, the point is that it's not just uh, picking and choosing. It's a package. Um, on all areas, it is, uh, it is the way we will conduct business. And again, it's not sort of a refresh um, in terms of changing everything. No, it is actually tightening what needs to be tightened. Um, so I think the point here is the timing, okay? The timing is starting now. So this is a continuous process. 
So it is not, you will not see a sort of, a, uh, let's say, a before and after. Um, those elements, some of them will take a bit of time. For instance, we've talked about the central securities depository. That actually we've already been working on for some time. And uh, maybe it will be fully in place, maybe definitely within the next uh, nine months. Um, we believe it will probably be in place by, um, well, by the end of the year. And that will in itself accelerate or improve the efficacy of uh, monetary operations. Secondly, in terms of the interbank, um, as you mentioned, um, that is already something that we are doing. You remember the issue had been uh, the, the segmentation of the market. And so there are certain things we are doing, as indicated, to strengthen uh, this market. And, uh, and I think here is where you are, you know, you're sort of moving from uh, one color to the next. So it's a sort of a continuum and we are moving in a particular direction. It is good to have the MPC tell us, yes, this is the right direction, et cetera. So let's just say that that is, uh, on the inflation forecasting, by the way, um, it's not just inflation forecasting, right? It is, uh, it's more complicated than that, but so be it. And this actually, we've been working quite hard. We have already improved the, it is called the FPAS, um, the, that system, um, but I think like everything else, like the Land Rover I mentioned, you need to tweak it every now and then, check the brakes, um, check the whatever else needs to be checked, the spark plugs, etc. So I think the point here is that this is something that we are doing and uh, will continue to do, but it is good for you to know what our targets are, meaning what is it that we are trying to do. And, uh, and I think it is in that spirit that we actually put out that paper. Um, Stawi, I don't have numbers here, so I don't think I can answer that on Limo uh, at this moment. Uh, um, David asks about uh, what is the impact really of, uh, of the um, the, the, the taxes. I don't know if I mentioned it, um, but in a sense we did put together the, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned, maybe I did, but if I didn't, uh, did I? Yes. Okay, I did, so it's there. Fine. So next question, next question is uh, on, oh, well, I talked about the white paper. Have I missed anything? I think I've covered those two. Okay. So the next batch of questions, uh, the first one is from Faisal Ahmed of Citizen TV. Faisal asks, good morning, does the governor share the uh, sentiments, I believe, uh, of bankers that the coming elections will slow down the growth of the economy? Uh, next one is from Alex Mwangi of NTV. Inflation edged up to 6.3% in June. The U.S. economy is also facing inflation and fears of overheating. Is inflation the biggest headache post-COVID? Uh, the next one is from Moirore Kefa from Radio Citizen. Are we likely to see the MPC taking on an expanded mandate after reforms, i.e. an MPC looking beyond just inflation to incorporate aspects such as unemployment? The final one in this batch is from Jimmy Mbogo from Business Hour. Uh, why can the CBR not be lowered further given the economic conditions? Uh, and he also asks an extra question. What is the status of the regional currency? Is it still being considered? Okay, fine. So thank you for these questions. Uh, Faisal, um, I think we as Kenyans uh, always talk about upcoming elections. I think you can go back to what happened last year, last time, five years ago. And uh, there was a lot of noise, a lot of noise uh, about precisely like you're asking your question, will it impact growth, etc. And I think at the end, it didn't impact growth by as much as, uh, let's say, was feared by some. Um, I think uh, there was some very, uh, let's say, people that were, let's say, fun in the flames, but so be it. So I think for me, uh, I have a different view. We have business to do, and this is our economy, and this is our country. 
No, we'll still be here at the end of this year. We'll still be here at the end of 2020, we'll, uh, 2022. We'll still be here at the end of 2023. We'll still be here at the end of 2024, etc. So it's about time that we did things that will be beneficial to us also in the long run. We need to begin planting coconuts. I don't know, Faisal, if you've ever planted coconuts. Coconuts, generally, uh, you'll never eat from them, the ones you plant from. You are eating from coconuts that others planted. And you know, society is at its best, as somebody told me. Um, it's at its best when we plant coconuts that we know you're not going to benefit from, you're not going to eat from. So it's about time that we began to uh, really do things that are beneficial to the country, um, even though maybe in terms of your quick uh, benefit um, to yourself directly is little. Um, we talked about inflation, Alex. I don't think inflation will be the, high, with the, will be the biggest headache post-COVID. Um, why? Because we know how to handle inflation. The question today is whether it is permanent or terminal, uh, or temporary. I'm talking now about the advanced economies. That's why they're, they're really excited about this. And unfortunately, that excitement has come to us um, asking those same questions because you, maybe we are reading the wrong things in Bloomberg or other places. Um, so the point I'm making is we as uh, practitioners, central bankers, Understand inflation and how to deal with inflation. Now, it's true, things may come, it may come from a different direction, so we may be blindsided. Um, maybe at the beginning, as the Fed chair has been saying, says that, uh, and also the, the U.S. Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury has been saying that, yeah, it looks like some of this uh, is uh, predominantly um, temporary. But if actually they, dis they discover that it is, uh, it is a permanent or there's a permanent component, I mean, they'll need to move quickly. So I think that is the issue. And uh, the question is, will they be caught flat-footed? Well, I don't know. I think they know once they, they decide to move, they'll need to move. They, they know what to do. But I think the bigger questions is, uh, in my mind, are two. The first is the continued, um, let's say, problems, potential problems with regard to financial stability, right? So in terms of uh, the markets, et cetera. And uh, there may be a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, yeah, noise, instability uh, that may actually come if, uh, from various sources. So I think market stability, uh, remains a concern. And so far, we haven't had uh, disaster in uh, the markets, but uh, it is important to keep a watch on that. Secondly, in terms of the long-term post-COVID issues, without a doubt, the biggest issues relate to human beings, meaning uh, things like education, things like health. We've lost a lot. We've lost a lot of ground in the context of the S SDGs. So those things will need to be front and center of any discussion going forward. Those are the things that policymakers will need to deal with, and they're not sort of quick fixes. So I think in terms of the issues or policy issues that we um, policymakers around the world will be concerned about, I think those are the more fundamental things, less about um, inflation, et cetera. Uh, the question of expanded mandate, Moirori asks that. Um, I, that's not the question that we are dealing with today. And frankly, we don't want to have uh, what you are calling an expanded mandate. We already have a mandate that incorporates concerns of unemployment, um, or rather concerns about uh, growth. Um, now, whether it is growth of an or unemployment is an issue of taste. Um, but if you look at our charter, it is already there. It's already in there. But first mandate is inflation, meaning price stability. And I think that is important. You've seen also we've been doing a lot of work on financial um, inclusion. Um, that is also incorporated in, in the various things in, 
uh, in our mandate. So I think uh, that is something that, uh, so we are okay with where our mandate is at this moment. Um, the question was about financial conditions and uh, scope for lowering the CBR. You know, you lower, this, you lower the rate uh, to do, to achieve a certain objective, right? So that is policy. So you step on the accelerator because you want to move faster, etc. You know that process. The point is today and now, there's a lot of liquidity in the system. I just talked about significant open market operations. So what would be the purpose of lowering the rate? So you see, at the end of the day, it, is, it works. I mean, think about the channel um, that, the, that uh, um, let's say, trans, transmitting that impulse. How does that work if it doesn't work through credit and through sort of availability of liquidity, et cetera? So today, banks have liquidity. Um, nothing is stopping them from actually uh, putting out more lending, you know, more borrowing from your perspective. So I think the point here is it's not, uh, um, it is not a one-to-one -one in that sense. But yes, um, if indeed there is scope for lowering, if indeed it is warranted, yes, we can still lower it. That's not a concern. But you lower it to increase liquidity um, and to increase credit, well, uh, the concerns there will still remain. Um, so I think I've answered the question. Status of the regional currency, I think all I can say here is we continue to discuss it. I'm currently the, uh, the chairman of uh, the MAC, as we call it, which is the monetary um, committee, the monetary, uh, why do I forget the MAC? <laughs> monetary Affairs Committee. It's amazing we have acronyms that remain with us and uh, when you need to get to it, you. Yeah, you draw a blank. So the Monetary Affairs Committee, um, I'm now the chair of this, and, uh, and I think, in a sense, we are still committed uh, to moving uh, forward with this sort of regional integration, and that is something that has, been, uh, uh, that has been, again, reinforced by the leaders in their last meeting, and uh, will continue to be that. Now, in terms of the pace, et cetera, all those are things that obviously um, are beyond this sort of conversation. I think that covers them. Uh, another set of questions. Victor Madala from The Star. The NIFC, I believe this is a Nairobi International Financial Center, is taking shape with some international firms already showing interest. What is CBK doing in readiness for this in terms of uh, anti-laundering anti Patrick Alishula from the Business Daily. Uh, banks would submit loan pricing models to CBK for approval following the removal of rate caps. How far is CBK in reviewing or approving the approvals? Dominic Omondi from The Standard. What happened to Kenya's intention to extend the DSSI to the end of 2021? And uh, finally, again from David Herbling uh, from Bloomberg. Where do you see the fiscal deficit in FY21-22, that's a financial year, given the environment, pandemic, and what was the actual outturn in the year ended June? Okay, so let me begin with Victor, uh, Victor's question. I think this is straightforward, right? Uh, from the perspective of everybody has their own mandate. So yes, in as much as the finances or funding or whatever coming into the country, uh, goes through banks, et cetera. I mean, the same AML CFT policies will remain in place. So it doesn't matter whether you're in the NI, in a sort of a, uh, international financial center um, or not. If you're in this jurisdiction, we do not want uh, to be blacklisted because of uh, being maybe allowing let's say, money laundering to take place through our jurisdiction. I think that would be a net loss, significant net loss to our country. So I don't think there's anything else to say, but I think it is important to note that, yes, um, this is a, 
evolution in terms of having the financial center, international financial center, is an evolution that I think, uh, well, you could say it's a natural evolution. Um, but I think the point here is that uh, it isn't just AML CFT. We should also see at the benefits um, of, of uh, such a financial center in terms of, let's say, and we've seen other financial centers around the world in terms of employment um, for, let's say, our highly, highly qualified and technical people, accountants, lawyers, uh, financial people, etc. So I think there's a lot to be said um, in this regard. Um, and uh, now Patrick asks about banks submitting uh, loan pricing models. Uh, you know, Patrick, I think we need to understand each other because this, this question is, shows some serious misunderstanding. But uh, so from you, I mean, the point is that we did ask all commercial banks uh, to provide us with their business models, um, sort of a refresh of those business models, and uh, to discuss with them. And we, d we have been doing that. Uh, we never, there wasn't this business of approval. I don't know why you're getting the approval from following the removal of CAPS. That was back in 2019. So I think the context uh, is wrong um, and uh, the question is wrong. The context is simple that, in the, that uh, we are actually uh, looking to strengthen uh, the, the way banks operate. And one of the pillars, as you know, in the banking sector charter is this um, having them being risk-based pricing of loans. So how do they do that? These are banks that had never really done risk-based pricing. So how do they do that? And so we had those conversations with them. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, um, we have had very good conversation and moved on with a lot of these banks. Um, there has been some that we say, well, listen, you haven't done your work well. Um, so go and uh, you know, maybe revise it. And I'm sure uh, while you are a student, that happened to you um, when you went to your teacher and, uh, and you know, asked to redo your work because maybe there were things that were obvious that needed to be fixed. So I think that is clear. Um, but I think I, so I, I leave it as that. Um, what happened to Kenya's intention to extend DSSI? Uh, I think you need to appreciate it's not, it wasn't Kenya that was at issue here, my friends, right? We can always extend it. Uh, we can always want to extend, but remember it's, uh, it takes two to tango. And this was the offer by the G20, and uh, the issue was they, 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 we did have, and they, um, they gave us the DSSI, meaning this is the debt, uh, um, debt uh, suspension uh, initiative, the debt service suspension initiative that was done by the G20 in the, con well, also, in supported by the IMF, World Bank, and et cetera. And uh, the first was a six month, uh, sort of uh, for a six month period. And, uh, and that was from January, right? Uh, I mean, well. Now the second period to the end of this year, to the end of this year, they've actually agreed on it, but there hasn't been final sort of uh, the finality that uh, is needed on all that. So I think the point I'm making here is that uh, we have always been very supportive of that because it will provide us with some sort of room uh, to undertake other issues like on fiscal, et cetera, expenditures, urgent expenditures. But I think uh, everything needs to be tied down, you know, so not just uh, accepting the policy, but actually in the end, uh, signing what needs to be signed, etc., and some of those things do take time. So I leave it there. If you want more information, you can always ask the National Treasury on that. Um, there was a question about fiscal deficit. I would also ask you to look at the budget document uh, and uh, 
the minister did issue those documents and they supported the uh, the finance bill which is now which has now been put in place and it had uh, clear targets on the deficit it had clear targets on revenues it had clear targets on expenditures related to the pandemic etc Final uh, question, just a couple of questions about the banking sector. Uh, Jimmy Bogo from Business Hour asks, what is the status of M NPLs, those are non-performing loans, and what's the percentage change? Any indication on where loans are being directed to? And uh, finally, from Patrick Alushula from the Business Daily, what is the status of loans that have been restructured? What proportion is actually in performing status following the end of the restructuring program? Okay, these are very specific and uh, do want to well i will only mention them in passing or rather i won't have a complete answer on this um, but uh, in terms of npls it was actually indicated in our press release um, and now i'm looking for it yes uh, halfway through a third of the way on the second page uh, we mentioned that the npls now stood in terms of um, non-performing loans as a share of gross, as a percentage of gross loans. This stood at 14%, and uh, it has come down from 14.2. Um, and if you remember, we had uh, talked uh, some time ago about uh, we doing a stress test of a kind, um, doing some stress tests, and uh, one of the scenarios that we had um, we had uh, the uh, NPL, NPLs going as a ratio of gross loans um, rising to 14.7. That was the number that we had, uh, um, we had seen and we had said we are comfortable with that. And actually this was what underpinned the policies, uh, was one of the items that underpinned the policies that we put out uh, some time ago. So. I think the point is the repayments and recoveries, as was indicated there, um, there were significant recoveries, loans, sorry, repayments and recoveries um, in those sectors, manufacturing, agriculture, trade, real estate. And I think it is important to appreciate that they are, both of those are happening. So it isn't just, uh, um, let's say, um, some sort of write-off that is going on. Oh, no, there has been repayments and recoveries, which is important and shows that banks are actually working um, with their customers. So this goes back to an area point with regard to the banking sector uh, charter, um, where banks should really be uh, customer-centric, working with, the bank, with, the, with their customers. So that's all I want to say about that. Um, I think uh, in terms of the loan restructuring that uh, we mentioned, uh, Patrick, you should look at uh, what we said before because uh, we did say that this, was, this ended in March, in, uh, at the end of June, right? March, it ended in March. So it was for a one year period and at the end of March, um, in a sense, we went back to, let's say, the uh, the way of the way we have been doing things in the past, meaning the restructuring period ended and we were no longer encouraging uh, in the context of COVID, encouraging banks to, uh, I mean, they're still working with their customers as needed, but I think the point is that from our perspective that window had closed and uh, I leave the rest. And we had indicated that I think in our last, uh, in our last, um, yeah, in our last presentation. Also, it is in the, in the paper. It is in the white paper. It's buried in there in the white paper as well. So very quick one. I know I said last question, but a very quick one that's coming from Razia Khan, and that's the one we wind up with. Razia is a chief economist for Africa and the Middle East for Standard Chartered. Uh, she asks, credit growth appears firm, but election periods typically see some slowing in credit. Okay, so I, I thank you, Razia. Um, I think, as I explained before, uh, the, 
the, um, the argument for accommodative policy has to be seen against the current conditions of what we would say a very liquid market. So yes, uh, there will be a slowdown in, uh, um, if you project it in this way uh, during the election period because businesses are probably not uh, uh, fully confirmed in terms of their, of their business plans. Um, although I would say that it's about time we began to uh, not be driven by political uh, cycles um, and really to maintain things because at the end of the day, um, whatever happens, it will be, I mean, we are all committed to a market-based economy. So I think the point uh, of market-based policies, etc. So I think the point here is I, I wouldn't put too much, uh, too much weight in the sort of slowing down of credit demand, um, particularly if you are coming out of a period where we were sort of compressed and uh, businesses were, um, were not doing what they would typically be doing. So I can imagine that there will be a lot more. For instance, think about the hotel industry. During this period, actually, a lot of them uh, used the opportunity to refresh or to rebuild, um, renovate, etc. And that required uh, credit, for sure. So I'm pretty sure there'll be those sort of things that will be happening, and uh, therefore I don't see it as, a, as, a, as an argument for accommodative policy. Um, for me, the issue remains we need to be uh, careful about shocks. You know, be ready to move in any direction. So flexibility is really um, the word today. And uh, I think that is what we would recommend to everybody, including the banks. Thank you. So thank you very much. That was our governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Njoroge. And that brings us to the end of today's press briefing. We expect the next Monetary Policy Committee meeting to be in Uh, let you know on that. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. All the documents referred to will be shared uh, in due course. But thank you. Good afternoon and see you next time.